That's okay. Okay, so I get no feedback. That's on, is it? No, okay. Okay, uh, hi there, my name's Simon Riggs, as we just said, um, and I've been told to speak loudly, uh, so I'm going to speak loudly about PostgreSQL, also known as Postgres. Um, full disclosure, uh, I haven't got any devices attached to me apart from the microphone, uh, so no hidden Raspberry Pis or anything like that. Uh, I'm going to be talking about databases for the Internet of Things, specifically Postgres. Um, I'm one of the people that write Postgres, so please shout out abuse if you really don't like what you hear. Uh, so who's heard of Postgres? Show of hands, please. Okay, uh, keep your hands up if you know something about Postgres. Okay, oh, that's, that's good, okay, you want to teach me. <coughs> so, uh, Postgres is an open source database. Uh, come on in, don't worry. Uh, it's an open source database with BSD style license. Uh, a lot of people think that it's a relational database. People that don't like it tend to call it a relational database because they feel that that hat somehow limits it and makes it 20 years old, as I've heard it said. Uh, so Postgres is actually an object relational database which makes it highly extensible uh, and what that's given us over the years is uh, the easy ability to add new data types, add new types of index uh, and specifically some of the things I'm going to be talking to you about today is our ability, fairly recent, to store uh, JSON data within the database in a compressed and yet indexable form. Uh, and that's known as JCB, uh, as well as our ability to store uh, GIS data within the database, which is via a package called PostGIS. So uh, what I was asked to do was do a demo. Uh, so I'm going to do uh, a demo just on my laptop. Uh, and what I wanted to do is just give you a very simple uh, database to think about. Uh, it's a single table and it's got two columns in it, one called TS, which is a, a timestamp, uh, and another column called J, uh, which is of type JSONB. Uh, and into that simple table, I've got uh, a pretty simple blob of JSON, uh, which has got uh, a field called device, which has got a number, and then uh, 12 things that I'm calling measures, but obviously they could be temperature or position or air pressure or anything you wanted uh, that to be. So the, the JSON that I'm storing, uh, it, the schema doesn't matter, this is just a demo. Uh, the number of fields in the, in the JSON block doesn't matter, that's just a demo as well. Okay, so I'm just giving you a flavour of what's possible. Um, and on that table I'm adding a single index. Um, and uh, I'm going to be using a new type of index that we have in Postgres 9.5 called a, a block range index or a brin index. And this is a type of index that's specifically designed to be low overhead as you insert data into it. And it's also specifically designed to have uh, a very low overhead as the table grows. So it's, it is specifically designed for tables uh, of like terabytes and above. Uh, size and uh, what I'm here to tell you about is really the that's specifically for the Internet of Things. Um, so this is the bit where I wish I'd put my mic on so I uh, attempt to do that here if you let me know if there's a problem with the, uh, the audio. Uh, so what I've done here is uh, just set up uh, a simple database. Uh, as you can see I've got a single table in the database uh, as I've just described. Uh, the current uh, table has got 2.2 million rows in it uh, and uh, it, that is 430 megabytes. So rather than you do uh, anything uh, attaching to the internet, I'm just going to give you a demo just straight off my laptop. Okay. Um, so if we truncate that Uh, down to zero bytes in size. What I'm now going to do is uh, run a test where I actually load 
uh, data directly into that uh, database, single records at a time, just so that you get a flavour of roughly how fast Postgres is. Uh, so I'm, I'm loading 100,000 records uh, uh, using two connected sessions uh, through to the database and each individual uh, session is, uh, is inserting into the database so it's transactionally recording each and every individual insert. Uh, so in this particular example I've got uh, 11.7, nearly 12,000 transactions per second going into the database on my laptop okay um, and that's using fully safe fully uh, fully sound transactional semantics okay if you don't want that if you think that that kind of thing is is over the top uh, then we can do it a slightly different way um, Uh, what I've got here is the ability to use relaxed transaction semantics using a feature called synchronous commit equals off. What this does is it doesn't flush the transaction to disk when you commit. It just leaves it in memory and it's then flushed half a second later. So if you're willing to potentially lose some data in the event of a crash, we can greatly increase uh, the performance uh, uh, from the from the server. Okay, so by uh, enabling this feature, I get 32,000 transactions per second off of two sessions. Okay, um, so as we can see, we're getting 30,000 transactions per second using full individual uh, transactional semantics. But what I can also do is I can actually load. Uh, data into the server using bulk mechanisms uh, and previously I've prepared uh, a data set that's got 2.2 million rows in it and if I load that into the server uh, you'll see that that loads significantly faster than the individual uh, row mechanisms um, and hopefully that's going to come back about now. <laughs> so uh, 14, 14 seconds, 2.2 uh, million rows loaded, and uh, that means it's loading a million records every six seconds, okay, into the database. So uh, why why show you two things? Well. Obviously, if you want to just load the database with full trans transactional semantics, that works. If you want to accumulate records into batches before loading, that uh, is an even faster approach. Both of those are still transactionally sound, so you can still query the database while that's happening. Okay, So people can still be uh, accessing their application all the while you're doing this. doesn't put any form of table lock on the system. All that, uh, all that we require is that you cannot access data until it's been transactionally committed. Once it's committed, everybody can see it. Okay? Uh, so back to the details. So I've been loading uh, JSON blobs. Uh, what I was doing, actually, uh, the program that did that was actually randomly generating the JSON blog, uh, the JSON blog, and then inserting that. So it wasn't uh, predefined data; it was actually calculating that and loading that as part of that demo. So let's just have a look at the the numbers that we looked at. That's thirty thousand JSON messages per second, which works out to be ten million messages per hour uh, on my laptop. Okay. Uh, so if we had a bigger server with greater capability, you can imagine what you'd be able to do with that. Uh, the bulk data load was a million JSON uh, objects loaded in six seconds, which gives you 36 billion messages per hour loaded into my laptop. Okay, So imagine what you'd be able to do with a server. What I'm going to talk about in a minute is the fact that 
Uh, we also have uh, Postgres clustering uh, with a technology called Postgres Excel, and we've got uh, basically linear performance uh, for that. Uh, so what we'll be able to do is... Hi. I think your foundations are off a little bit there. Okay. I think it's, I think it's already 6 million per hour, not a billion. Uh, okay, that's a shame. <laughs> <laughs> Um, are you sure about that? Yeah, it's four times faster, right? No. If it's one million in six seconds, one hundred twenty thousand per second. Am I wrong? Okay. It's a lot. We're all geeks here, I mean. <laughs> yeah, you did the math while well, I did the presentation. No, it's good. <laughs> I think I'm right. So. <coughs> um, so where does all this come from? Uh, we ran a project recently called Axel. It was an EU-funded project. So almost all of you sitting in the room have been paying your taxes, I hope. Uh, and that's actually gone towards uh, funding Postgres for big data. What did we put into uh, Postgres as a result of this project? Well, uh, Brin indexes, which I've just described. Um, We've also put row-level security into the database, uh, which is of sufficient grade that you can have very complex medical privacy rules uh, inside the database. So, for example, what we'd be able to do there is have uh, devices that load things like blood sugar measurements uh, and blood pressure and heart rate centers, uh, sensors, loading data into a system but nobody but you or your doctor or somebody that your doctor had temporarily authorised uh, would be allowed to see those readings. Okay? Um, so one of the types of applications I uh, hope we'll be able to do with open source software uh, within 10 years is that you'll be sitting there stressing about something and you'll hear uh, an ambulance coming towards you and you'll go, that's strange, what's the ambulance for? And it will actually be uh, a, t a sensor on you that's detected that your blood pressure and heart uh, rates have risen uh, badly as a result of your stress and they've predicted uh, that you're going to have a stroke and so they've sent an ambulance to come and get you before you've even realised it's happening. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that we'll be able to do with the, uh, the transaction rates that I'm talking about. So we'll be able to take uh, a blood pressure uh, or glucose level reading from everybody in Europe uh, every minute. That's the type of numbers that we're talking about here. <clears throat> so what have we got in terms of Postgres clustering? Uh, the idea is that we're going to have a, a database that uh, is a single system image but it's uh, composed of many separate data nodes. Uh, this is just to be about to be released uh, as beta. We've benchmarked it using the industry standard TPCH benchmark, which is a complex decision support benchmark, not necessarily related to the Internet of Things. Uh, and the red lines are the performance of Postgres <coughs> Excel. The upshot of that is on a 16-node cluster, uh, we've got uh, quite a few of those queries going 16 times faster. Okay? The more complex queries, uh, in some cases, we uh, the performance dropped to like four or eight uh, times. Um, but overall, we've got uh, some very good performance. But the most important thing is that for simple queries, we've dem demonstrated linear performance gains or linear scalability so uh, if you can imagine the type of things we'd be able to do if you had a 128 node cluster you'll be able to scale that up significantly uh, and there's some other uh, graphs that show measurements of uh, linear scalability so the blue line is Postgres and then the lines above that are 2, 4 and 8 uh, node <coughs> performance and you can see it's uh, scaling upwards very nicely. Uh, we've done that test at uh, 16 nodes at the moment uh, and we, we think there's, uh, there's no particular reason why we can't go to 32 and 64 
Um, but you know, we, we're just sort of working our way up at the moment. Uh, one of the other things that uh, we have recently released is uh, a tool called PG Logical, uh, and what this is is a publish and subscribe data transport uh, extension for Postgres. And the idea here is that you'll be able to connect databases together into uh, into distributed data architectures. So, for example, you'll be able to have devices feeding into a regional centre and then regional centres feeding into area level centres uh, up to potentially <coughs> central data warehouses um, with, a, with a, a model that we'd be able to send reference data uh, down to the individual devices uh, and then collect uh, detailed data and send that back up the chain the other direction. Okay, so a replication in, in multiple different directions. But here we're sending uh, specifically the individual data items. We're not sending things like changes to the index or vacuum records and things like that don't get sent via this mechanism. Uh, the PG Logical uh, stuff all works uh, cross version now. Uh, so one of the things that uh, I think will be possible in the future is you'll be able to install Postgres uh, on your individual devices and those devices won't need to be upgraded for 10 years, but it will still be able to send data back uh, through uh, a distributed data architecture like this to a central server, where the central servers we're actually upgrading uh, each year as the software improves. Okay, so that's one of the, uh, the design objectives there. Uh, so uh, this was 25 minutes, and I wanted to say everything I wanted to say fairly quickly so there'd be some time for uh, questions. Uh, so I've got about six minutes left. What I'd like to, to do is just summarize some of the things I've told you about uh, Postgres. Um, so look, most importantly, the model you use for your data is flexible. You can use a schemaless design if you choose, or you can use a relational model, or a mixture of the two and there's other ways of doing things as well. Uh, so we support a number of different data types, that sort of flat structured data, but we also support document style, text style data, or GIS data as well. Uh, hopefully I've demonstrated that uh, the, uh, <coughs> the data loading rates uh, are easily sufficient uh, for you to consider using Postgres uh, for your applications. Uh, Although I didn't give a demonstration of the performance of it, uh, the Brin style indexes, uh, I, I, would, I would show, I would remind you that they, uh, the Brin index was in place while I loaded that data. Okay, so you could see how little the Brin index slowed down the data load. But the Brin index itself uh, acts very similarly to partitioning in that it will allow you to access uh, date ranges in that table uh, with, uh, with high performance. So that's what it's specifically designed to do. Um, also being announced is Postgres Excel. Uh, that's going to be announced in, in the next week or so. Um, and uh, I've also showed you, uh, or at least discussed, the fact that we've got low level security if you need it. Uh, and we've also got um, integrated uh, data transport facilities to create not just a single server but a whole distributed data architecture that is appropriate for the Internet of Things. Uh, and last point is that many people like Postgres because the BSD style license means you've got the capability to install it on devices and not worry too much that somebody's going to be chasing you with some uh, copyright infringement uh, or you know, some sort of babble about GPL or whatever. So uh, it's uh, particularly suitable for embedded devices as well as big data. Um, so that's, that's Postgres. Um, I hope I've given you a, a good flavour of uh, that specifically for the Internet of Things. Um, so over to questions. Who's got a question? Hello, ah, you have to bring the microphone to the... I'm sorry? You have to walk to the person who... Okay. 
I'll walk to you, thanks. How are you? How are you? Not very well, thank you. Good demo. Best to see you, Platter. Uh, it's an SST, so. <coughs> Luckily enough, I can afford one now after, <coughs> after years of uh, not. I just, I just checked your figures again. Um, so you can do 100 million per hour with uh, the and 800 million per hour. Okay, that's good. I'll check those figures myself as well. So, uh, anybody else? Sorry. So if I can put JSON data in a column, yes. can I also index by a field in the JSON data? So the, the question is, can we index the individual JSON items? And the answer is definitely yes. Uh, we've got uh, index types that uh, allow you to, uh, to index particular uh, elements of the JSON blob. Uh, and you can have different index types uh, on each of the individual items if you wish. We can just, in fact, uh, index the whole blob uh, so that you've got a kind of in, uh, everything index approach. Uh, so we do that using an index type called GIN, which stands for Generalized Inverted Index, which is essentially the same type of uh, index that Elasticsearch and Google uses. Uh, other questions, please? So it Hi. basically means that... Uh, Sorry. The microphone, please. How did you do that? <laughs> So, so, go ahead. so basically it means that your stimulus is also valid for the JSON. So you can change the JSON. And Absolutely it. correct, yes. So I have one question. Is, um, you always recommend to go to uh, an intermediate software that tools to the database, or can the IoT devices, the chips, should they talk directly to the Flutter server? Or, uh, uh, well, I'm a database guy. As long as you put it in Postgres, I don't mind how it gets there. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's, there's a lot of other considerations that you need to, to think about. In some cases, it's possible to go direct. In some cases, not. I don't know. So. Do, you know do you know about uh, libraries for small devices that allow you to connect directly? Well, obviously, we just use the Postgres client. Uh, libraries for that, so uh, but they're available from a number of different languages. So there's language bindings for basically everything. So. I do have a question. So there wasn't supposed to be a base. It's it's a capability of Postgres that you can access it anywhere from anything. So yeah. can you come with the microphone? Yep. One of my previous job, I did a lot of CouchDB, okay. which is all JSON all over the place. Sure. And, and the previous job, I did uh, uh, four years of Postgres uh, sure. SQL. Yeah. So I was wondering, uh, with your knowledge of Postgres, uh, maybe your knowledge, I don't know if you do have uh, uh, CouchDB. Uh, CouchDB is uh, everybody, everything is JSON, uh, and it's optimized for JSON, so I was wondering uh, if you could do a parallel with advantages and disadvantages of uh, this? Uh, well, obviously, I have an opinion on CouchDB and I prefer Postgres. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, what I can tell you, I think a direct comparison, I think, would be unfair um, in, in many ways. What I can tell you with, with Postgres is that it's, it's a database platform that contains many different elements. So uh, we are innovating uh, and progressing the Postgres technology very rapidly in a number of different areas. And all of the areas of progress all interlock and interreact. Inter, uh, so the types of things that you're getting there, enhanced security, enhanced indexing, new data types, all come together in Postgres and that's why I work on it and why I recommend it because uh, if you design your own data store you're basically losing all of the momentum and all of the additional features uh, that you get with the Postgres package. So uh, Postgres may not always be uh, the first to innovate in use of new features like a new data type like JSON uh, but we do innovate in many 
in, in many areas. Uh, so the post-GIS implementation, for example, is, is widely acknowledged to be the best in the world. Uh, and obviously, you know, things like transactional semantics, uh, robustness, uh, as well as performance, is what Postgres is noted for. So uh, you know, I don't want to kind of uh, diss other projects. Just want to point out that Postgres has got uh, a lot of momentum and a lot of focus, uh, with with uh, uh, lots of different features coming together in one place. Any other questions? Bye. Uh, so, Brin indexes can be used with any data type. Uh, they're specifically designed for use with naturally ordered uh, things. So, the, uh, the example of date time there is, is useful because the data na has a natural ordering. So, if you, uh, another example of something that you might want to use would be a sort of order ID uh, which would naturally increment over time. That's, that's its, for its best use case. Uh, if the data's uh, sort of all over the place, then it uh, is, is much harder to, to use that style of index. So this, this uh, Postgres has got six different types of index, uh, all suited for different use cases. Um, so whether it's uh, sort of B-tree is uh, useful for OLTP, uh, high volatility inserts, updates, deletes, or well, Brin is more suitable for historical tables, and we've also got text style indexes as well of uh, various kinds. Yeah. Hi. Uh, So, so the, the progress that we're making on parallel queries that we're developing uh, intra-node parallel query, uh, which means you'll be able to scale it to the number of CPUs uh, within a particular node. Uh, the technology I'm presenting here with uh, Postgres Excel uh, allows you to scale across multiple nodes uh, so that you can actually get a much higher degree of parallelism using Excel than you can with the intranode parallel query. Uh, the parallel query that we've got doesn't cover all in, uh, all types of query. Uh, so the Postgres 9.6 version that will be out later this year, maybe September if we're lucky, will contain the first elements of intranode parallel query. Okay, sir. Thank you very much. That's, that's all the time we have. Bye.